This video has been sponsored and approved by Skillshare. Beware. The scenes that you'll find in this educational video might be disturbing to some viewers. It contains scenes of graphic education and ex okay, this is a dumb bit. It's not necessary anyway, because this video is going to be the opposite of scary. You know how when you have to explain a joke, it's not funny anymore? I think the same could be easily applied to horror. This is not an excuse for missing a Halloween upload by three months, and you cannot prove otherwise. A lot of the fear that these kind of things instill in you is through making you ask questions. What exactly is out there? What does it want from me? Is it going to kill me? These kind of questions are what Five Nights at Freddy's capitalizes on. You're thrown in a room that isn't safe and you can't escape from it. You can observe these animatronics approaching you, but you can't stop them. All you can do is wonder. Well, wonder no longer because I think it's safe to say that Five Nights at Freddy's is, by most definitions, pretty dead. I'm not saying the FNAF series itself is dead or anything, by the way. Like, it wasn't even a little while ago they released that mobile game where you have to spin around in circles looking really scared. I'm talking about the original standalone title, The Very First Five Nights at Freddy's. And what do you do when fascinating creatures die? You dissect them. At this point, it's not really a secret that you can decompile older Click Team Fusion games, returning them to their original project file format. The nice thing about this is that Click Team Fusion itself is a block-based coding software, which essentially means coding in it is very fast and simple. While in a normal situation, I would have to spend a monumental amount of time reverse engineering everything and figuring out what each line of code and variable does, I managed to completely document everything I wanted to know about both this game and how every character behaves in less than a couple hours. It notates itself, really. To be honest, it was so easy that it made me kind of uncomfortable. I certainly wouldn't want someone else decompiling my software to scrutinize every line of code and coding decision I've made, but I suppose the least I can do is refrain from showing the original code for things and just focus on what the code does. Action, not words, right? Speaking of which, I'm trying something a little different for this video as far as background visuals. I did record some gameplay of Five Nights at Freddy's for the video, but as it turns out, watching somebody flick through cameras the whole time without error looks really boring. That's why we're using Let's Players for this video's background footage, considering that's kind of what the game is known for anyway. I imagine none of these faces need any introduction, but just in case, you can find their channels in the description in order of appearance. But putting that aside, welcome to Tech Rules. But before that, a huge thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring today's video. When it comes to learning unique skills, like putting together an educational video, designing your own smash hit horror game, or just picking up important skills that'll help you all throughout life, there's no better way to learn than from the experts themselves. That's where Skillshare comes in. Skillshare is a community of passionate teachers and creators who want to share that passion with you. You can learn a countless amount of new skills here, whether you're trying to get into a new career or just want to take that hobby you love to the next. Next level. If you're wondering where you should start, might I recommend this class? Real Productivity, How to Build Habits That Last, a class hosted by a fellow YouTuber that goes over vital skills for making results. If you're anything like me, you'll definitely want to give this one a try. And if you click the convenient link in the description, you can start the year off right by getting two months of Skillshare Premium absolutely free. And if you want to keep that learning streak going, you can continue the subscription afterward for only around $10 a month. So give Skillshare a shot and start expanding your abilities today. I suppose if I'm going to explain all of the animatronics AI, I should at least start with the basics. It has been a while since the game came out after all, so it's probably easy to forget some of the smaller details. Five Nights at Freddy's features four main animatronics. Freddy, Bonnie, Chica, and Foxy. For the sake of unnecessary categorization, let's put Freddy, Bonnie, and Chica in a category named Bullies, because they're constantly harassing you. And let's put the remaining animatronics in a group called Foxy, because that's his name. The Bullies constantly move around during the night and approach your office, forcing you to keep track of them and close doors when necessary. Foxy, on the other hand, acts a little more chill slash aggressive. 
He spends most of his time in Pirate's Cove, only leaving to slam into your office door at max speed. The trigger for this is poor camera usage. The less you use the camera to keep him in place, the more he inches off the stage, and if he escapes, you only have a short amount of time to close the door and force him to run back. When one of the bullies gets to their final destination, which can either be in or outside your office depending on the animatronic, they won't attack you immediately. Instead, they'll just get comfortable and wait for you to open the camera. Foxy is the counter to the strategy, because he does not care what you're looking at, he just wants to eat you. You could just let him charge you and then block him with your door, but that takes away from your precious power that you need to preserve throughout the night. The first time he charges, he takes away 1%, and that penalty increases by 6% every time he does it. That means if you don't keep him locked down, your power is going to plummet. Evading Bonnie and Chica is simple though. If they show up at your door, close it. They'll eventually go somewhere else. Freddy, however, never backtracks. You can use the camera to impede his progress, but he'll eventually get to the corner of the hallway right next to the office. From here, he'll wait until you're busy looking at a camera other than his and attack, assuming you left the door open for him to get in. That's about the extent of this game's common knowledge. So you might be wondering, if people have already figured out that much, how much could there be left to know? A lot, actually. In fact, I would go as far as to say that information is bare bones when it comes to how this AI works. That probably seems like an absurd claim considering how popular the game became and how much the AI was closely studied in order to beat the notorious 2020-2020 mode, where all the animatronics are set to max aggression. In this scenario, how could people have possibly missed the rest? Well, that would be because the game is intentionally designed to have an extremely confusing and inconsistent AI. Almost every action or decision the animatronics can take have some sort of luck factor to them, and I do mean almost every single one of them. That makes it hard to understand how the AI truly works, because patterns people may pick up on might just be a result of lucky coincidence. It's part of the game's horror aspect, actually. The more unpredictable your potential robotic killers are, the more naturally terrifying they are. After all, your ability to keep tabs on what they're doing is literally the only thing that's keeping you from a jump scare and subsequent death. Some of the things I'm about to talk about were already discovered by creative people who tried things better based on a hunch, but the only reason I'm able to tell you most of this is because I'm looking at the game's code, otherwise I would only know a fraction of it. Which brings me to my next point, the whole seeing patterns where there actually aren't anything. Yeah, it happened. A lot, actually. In fact, let's do a little true or false game with some of the most common theories. Gameplay theories, I should mention, not lore. I'm not opening up that can of worms. Anyway, feel free to follow along, see how many of these you actually get right. Theory. You have to look at Foxy to keep him in Pirate's Cove, but looking at him too much will cause him to be aggressive. Answer. False. This one isn't even hard to test, but it seems so common. Just set Foxy's AI to 20 and start flipping the camera up and down. You'll see that he can't move an inch. More on how Foxy works later. Theory. You don't actually have to look at Foxy to keep him away. Camera usage is the only thing that matters. Answer. True, actually. This is something that's genuinely helpful to know, too, because it lets you keep the camera on something more important, usually Freddy. I feel like more people should know this, though, because the game literally tells you something along those lines. The character in there seems unique in that he becomes more active if the cameras remain off for long periods of time. I guess he doesn't like being watched. I don't know. Theory. When you run out of power, don't move. This will give you a little time before Freddy attacks. Answer. False. I'm pretty sure this theory comes from the game too. Uh, hey listen, I, I had an idea. If you happen to get caught and want to avoid getting stuck into a Freddy suit, uh, try playing dead. You know, go limp. Then there's a chance that uh, maybe they'll think that you're an empty costume instead. People understandably interpreted this as a hint, but surprisingly there's nothing in here that checks whether or not you're moving during the blackout phase. The duration of each blackout phase is extremely variable, so I could see how easy it would be to believe this just because of sheer confirmation bias. Okay, last one. Theory. There's a hole behind the Freddy Fazbear poster in the office that Freddy can use to bypass the door. Answer. What? I know, it sounds like I'm making this up, but I used to hear this all the time back in 2014. My best guess is the theory came from this old Markiplier video, where he closed both doors and still got attacked shortly after. I'll explain why that can happen in a second, but that's definitely not why. I can't find evidence of anyone saying this now, but I swear I'm telling the truth. Someone in the comments back me up on this, please. 
prove to everyone that I'm not crazy, including myself, I guess. Anyway, the point I'm trying to make here is a lot of these incorrect theories were just as highly regarded as the correct ones, which I guess is a testament to how well the game kept its secrets hidden. It almost makes me want to refrain from revealing everything about the AI. Unfortunately, almost isn't enough. Let's begin. I'm gonna guess the thing people are most interested in learning about is probably the AI aggression system. Essentially, this game has a custom night mode, where you can set each individual animatronic to an AI level ranging from 0 to 20, with 0 being completely deactivated and 20 being, obviously, maximum aggression. Also, if you select 1987, the game does this. This mode was really popular, not only because it resulted in an extremely difficult challenge that returned in almost every game, but also because... Well, it was just really cool that the developer went out of his way to develop a custom mode like this. Well, I suppose I should mention one thing, it probably didn't take much effort to implement this at all, because the 0 to 20 AI system is actually used throughout the entire game. In fact, I have the numbers right here to share with you. Night 1 uses AI level 0000, Night 2 uses 0311, Night 3 uses 1052, Night 4 has a random chance of either being a 1246 or 2246, Night 5 uses 3575, and night 6 uses 4, 10, 12, 16, being the only night to actually hit double digits. This list is probably raising some red flags, right? After all, I did say that AI level 0 means the animatronic is disabled, despite the fact that night 1 has zeros all across the board. That shouldn't make sense, because night 1 still has plenty of movement from the three animatronics. That's because the game does something really sneaky. As it turns out, animatronic AI levels actually increase as the night goes on. At 2 a.m., Bonnie goes up one AI level. At 3 a.m., everyone but Freddy goes up one AI level. And at 4 a.m., everyone but Freddy goes up yet another AI level. That means that night 1's AI levels are 0322 by 4 a.m. And night 6 goes as high as 4, 13, 14, 18, with Foxy being only two levels away from his max AI. This also means that Freddy is the only animatronic that does not get a level increase throughout the night, and as such is the only one that will remain disabled the entire night. So if you plug those numbers into the custom night mode, you'll get an experience that's similar to playing on that night. However, there will be one major difference, and that difference is power drainage. When you get to night 2 and onward, extra penalties are added to your power consumption. The penalty in question is dropping your power by 1% every few seconds. How many seconds it takes depends on the night. Night 2 takes 1 every 6 seconds, Night 3 every 5 seconds, Night 4 every 4 seconds, and Night 5 and onward every 3 seconds. That being said, the custom night mode also shares the 3 second penalty, so using the AI levels of Night 5 and 6 will also give you an almost identical experience with no noteworthy differences. It's also important to mention that these levels can never go higher than 20. Well, they can, but it doesn't make the animatronics any more aggressive. The reason for that is simply because the AI levels are, in a way, percentage-based. Here's how Five Nights at Freddy's uses these numbers. Approximately every four or five seconds, the animatronics are allowed to do what we're going to call a movement opportunity. The game decides whether or not each animatronic is allowed to move during this opportunity by sheer luck. The game will pick a random number between 1 and 20. That number is then compared to the animatronic's current AI level. If the level meets or exceeds the random number, then the animatronic will move. This makes the AI levels sort of like percentages. AI level 1 gives the animatronic a 1 in 20 chance, or a 5% chance, to move at every movement opportunity. AI level 5 will give them a 25% chance, 10 will give them 50%, and finally, a maxed out AI level of 20 will give the animatronic a guaranteed 100% chance to move at every single movement opportunity. This won't make each animatronic move at the same time, though. They each take a slightly different amount of time to get their movement opportunity. Freddy gets one every 3.02 seconds, Bonnie every 4.97 seconds, Chica every 4.98 seconds, and Foxy every 5.01 seconds. So while the animatronics will be able to move at similar times at the beginning, their movements will quickly desynchronize. When one of the animatronics succeeds their movement opportunity, they'll, you know, move. Chica will randomly choose adjacent rooms on the right side, and Bonnie will straight up teleport to different rooms on the left just because he feels like it. That's lore now, that's canon. Foxy, on the other hand, he uses his movement opportunities a bit differently. Every successful movement opportunity will advance him one phase closer to attacking, but as we mentioned, his greatest weakness is the cameras themselves. While the cameras are on, Foxy goes into a state that we'll simply call locked. While in a locked state, Foxy will automatically fail all of his movement opportunities, regardless of what random number he pulled or what his AI level is. He'll remain locked the entire time the cameras are on. However, when you finally turn the cameras off, he doesn't immediately spring back into action. 
In fact, he'll remain locked for a random amount of time that can range from around 0.83 seconds to around 16.67 seconds. It gets very specific too. The random amount of time the game decides on can literally be any frame between the two numbers. So yeah, quite a range. Once he hits phase 4, he'll attack either when you check the left hall or when around 25 seconds has passed. If blocked by the door, he'll take whatever amount of power he's supposed to at the time and immediately return to Pirate's Cove, starting in either Phase 1 or 2. You probably know what happens if the door isn't shut. Which reminds me, actually. I should probably explain how attacks work for the rest of the cast. Bonnie and Chica's are super simple. When they reach your door, they'll try to get in on their next successful movement opportunity. If the door is closed, they'll reset to the dining area. But if they get in, that door will be disabled and they'll wait for the next time you lower the camera to attack. If you stay in the camera for too long, which in in this case would be about 30 seconds, your camera will be forced down and you'll be attacked anyway. This may sound strange, but there's a nice thing that happens when Bonnie and Chica reach AI level 20 that makes your life a little easier. When they're right outside your door, they're still guaranteed to move at the next movement opportunity. Why is that good? Well, on lesser difficulties, it's not uncommon for them to go on a streak of failing their movement opportunities repeatedly. This keeps them in place and forces you to keep your door closed for much longer than you'd like. The knowledge that they'll always attempt an attack within 5 seconds is a nice Nice break in an otherwise very cruel challenge. In fact, if you happen to literally be the world's unluckiest person, you could have the animatronics on night one move to you with speeds comparable to AI level 20 and then just stay there for the entire night. Kinda makes me wonder if 2019-19-20 mode would theoretically be more difficult than 2020-2020. Now you may have noticed that until now, I've avoided talking about Freddy very much. That's intentional because Freddy is a doozy. Similar to Foxy, using the cameras while Freddy takes a movement opportunity will automatically cause him to fail it. However, when he does get a successful movement opportunity, he doesn't immediately start moving. Well, usually. Instead, he starts a sort of countdown. The simplest way to describe the countdown would probably be that it's 1000 minus 100x frames. X being Freddy's current AI level. For example, the countdown would be 900 frames at AI level 1, 800 frames at level 2, and so on. This game runs at 60 frames per second, so those times would be about 15 seconds and 13.33 seconds respectively, with each increase of AI level taking another 1.67 seconds. Once Freddy's AI level reaches 10 or higher, you might notice that the countdown will start at zero. While the countdown may as well not exist on higher AI levels, it's important to remember that Freddy only ever goes up to four outside of Custom Night. It's pretty clear Freddy wasn't exactly designed to be a very fair fight higher than nine, let alone 20. That's why micromanaging him is such an important part of 2020-2020 runs. Just like Foxy though, Freddy's biggest weakness is basic camera usage. Like we just established, looking at any of the cameras will lock Freddy in his place and fail his movement opportunities. However, the cameras don't affect his movement countdown, and he'll reactivate the moment the camera goes down. More specifically, if his movement countdown ends while the camera is up, he'll just wait ever so patiently for you to put the camera down. And the moment you do, he'll take his movement. Essentially, once Freddy is ready to move, there's no way to stop him. All you can do is slow him down. His attacks are interesting too, because they behave on a completely different set of rules. Once Freddy goes from his show stage to Cam 4B, which is snuggling in the corner behind your office, Freddy goes into his attack phase. While in attack phase, Freddy can no longer be frozen by using your cameras. He does, however, reveal a couple new weaknesses. While the cameras themselves no longer stop him in his place, looking directly at camera 4B will. And unlike Bonnie and Chica, Freddy can not enter your office while the camera is down. That means the only opportunity he'll get to attack is while you're looking at a camera that isn't his. And don't forget that movement opportunities are still a factor in this. No matter what the circumstances are, Freddy still can attack until he's succeeded in a movement opportunity since he's reached Cam 4B. Granted, that becomes less significant the more aggressive his AI is, but it's still a notable factor. Once these two conditions are met, however, Freddy will immediately attempt his attack. If blocked by the right door, he won't return to the dining area like Bonnie and Chica. Instead, he'll just return to the hall and try to get into the corner for another attempt. Yeah, once Freddy's there, he's there for good. And of course, if you're unfortunate enough to be ignoring Freddy while the right door is open, he'll enter the office. Now all that's left for him to do is perform his jump scare. Which, as it turns out, may not be guaranteed after all? First of all, the jump scare will only occur when your camera is down. And if you choose to hide in your camera, Freddy won't ever flip it down himself. 
And when you aren't in your camera, there only seems to be a 25% chance for Freddy to do a jump scare every second. That means the range of time it takes for Freddy to jump scare you can range from one second to never. Realistically speaking, you're not going to dodge every 25% chance for the entire night, unless you're already really close to winning, I guess, but I just thought it was interesting. Okay, I think that's a pretty detailed summary of the animatronics. At least, I don't think I missed anything. I guess we can move on to the final phase of the night that you never want to see. When you run out of power, the game essentially stops normal gameplay. There's nothing you can do during a blackout aside from look around and hope that the clock hits 6am before you die. There's not really much to explain either, all animatronic AI is essentially halted at this point. Even if Foxy was on his way or Freddy was in your office already, none of it matters. All that matters is timers. Every 5 seconds, you have a 20% chance for Freddy to show up and start playing his music box, up to a maximum of 20 seconds. If he doesn't show up within the allotted 20 seconds, he'll show up automatically. The music box duration has the same chance, 20% every 5 seconds, up to a maximum of 20 seconds. After that, the lights will flicker off, and the final section will begin. This one has a 20% chance every 2 seconds. And when that chance succeeds, well jump scare, and then game over screen. While I'm on the subject, the game over screen actually has a special property that I never knew about. While this screen is supposed to take you back to the title, there's a 1 in 10,000 chance it'll take you to the Golden Freddy jump scare. That's a 0.0001% chance of occurring every time you get a game over. I can safely say though, I've never seen this before. Out of curiosity, are there any Let's Players that genuinely got the jump scare like this? As small of a chance as it is, it would really surprise me if nobody encountered it while recording. Oh, speaking of Golden Freddy, I don't really have anything special to say about him. He behaves the exact way it looks like he behaves. I guess the only important information to note is that the Golden Freddy poster that summons him has a 0.00001% chance of appearing every time you look at that camera in particular. You can spam the camera to increase your chances, but keep in mind the random chance only updates every second. Yeah, not much to talk about there, but I figured somebody would bring it up. Aside from that though, that's pretty much everything I found interesting enough to talk about with this game and whoa, did I talk much longer than I thought I was going to. This video was originally supposed to be about deconstructing horror games in general. I already had like a whole list of notes made about Resident Evil 2 and how Mr. X behaves, but I'm gonna be lucky to fit what I already have within the 15 minute goal. Not that I ever managed to stay under that anyway. I guess I can at least call it here and ask you all if you would want to see a kind of series that goes in depth into horror games like this. I can't promise it'll be nearly as detailed as this one, but I'm sure I can at least find a decent amount of interesting things for other horror games. Anyway, I do want to give credit to Reddit user BoxFigs for the existence of this video. Back in like 2016 or something, someone shared a Reddit post that this user made that made me realize you can do this sort of stuff with fusion games. And while I didn't use any of their existing findings for this video, not because it's bad or anything, I just just prefer doing my own research to make sure I have everything right. I don't think I would have found out I could decompile this game if I never saw that post. You can find the original post in the description if you want to check it out. I'll also include a link for the subreddit they moderate, r slash technical FNAF, which is all about deconstructing FNAF games just like this one. Again, please think about letting me know if you want to see more horror game deconstruction as a sort of series. And as always, I hope you keep an eye out for more tech rules.